welcome to edition 105, 105, part two of our Killing Our Filler podcast with me, Rachel Fairburn, and Carrie Pritchard McLean. Just before we start, we'll do our usual disclaimer. This isn't hero worship. We do this <laughs> podcast because we're mutual interest in serial killers. And as long as we are doing this podcast, it stops us from writing to them in prison. Yes, part two of our episode on the Unabomber. It's February now. Yes, it's February now. Send clothes on. Weird. <laughs> we're, uh, we're recording this back to back after part one. Um, do we want to start with the ghost? Yeah, because I'm telling you, something happened, right? So I'm sitting here, and Owen may have kept this in, I'm not sure. I swear to God, I heard somebody say my name. Owen listened to it back, and he said, I can hear something, but it's like a, of a phone going off. And if it is kept in, you'll be able to see it or hear it. You look over there and look at your phone, and I look over because I thought I heard something. So it just was your phone going off. No, but I had nothing on my phone. There was no notification on the phone. And then I said, because I live in a very old farmhouse, but I didn't even realise when I was saying this, I said, oh, to be fair, this is the only building I've ever felt something like that. I've, You know, when I've been in here a couple of times. And what have you heard? Someone's saying my name in my ear. Thank you. But, so, you've never told me about that before. No. I, I, I heard somebody say my name and it sounded like they were here, but also muffled. And at first I thought it was your partner. I don't know why. Like, he might... Yeah, I want to know why, actually, yeah. <laughs> but but it, it sounded like a, a man's voice and that, that, and and I heard it and then it, and then you've now just told me this. Yeah, but weirdly, I didn't even think about that. Unbelievable. But, but yeah, I, I mean, it was your phone because I saw you pick it up. Yeah, but there was, no, there was no notification on it. It, it hadn't, have, it, it was once, but there was no, there was nothing there. So... I don't know. Maybe we've summoned a ghost. Now, another thing to worry about. <laughs> Great. Uh, um, we can have a correspondence section in this um, thing because actually some people have got in contact with some brilliant things. Can I start with mine first? Yes, of course. Go ahead. I'm going to read you a message that we got on the old Kalina Filler page. Um, it, brilliant. I'm going to reveal who it is after the first paragraph. So, evening, ladies. I came across your podcast by sheer accident and my attention was drawn to the episode regarding Ivan Malat. You remember the serial killer I've in Australia? Malat. I've Malat. Malat. You know the one. He goes on to say, May I say it was refreshing to hear a humorous side to such a dreadful chapter in my brother's life. This message is from Simon Onions, brother of, of Paul, Paul Onions. Onions. Unbelievable. He says, The part where you discuss the ridiculous Brummy accent played by the actor in the one documentary is hilarious because we and close friends and family have also seen the episode, have also pissed ourselves <laughs> listening to him, especially as Paul is from the black country and got a real thick accent. It's really funny because you're laughing because you're from the black country yeah. and, they're, and they're doing Brummy. I probably just did the wrong one then. You're like, hilarious. He doesn't sound like that. It's from the black country. Simon, Paul, everyone thinks you sound the same. <laughs> I'm really sorry, everyone. Everyone thinks that you sound like Brummies or like they all think it's one accent. It's also funny that the character in the dock is a six foot bean pole, yet my brother and the rest of us, spring onions, are more like the lollipop man out of the Wizard of Oz. I just wanted to say it's a refreshing change to hear it put across in a different way and some may be offended but I for one am not myself and Paul know that humour is the best tonic for staying healthy and he sure lives life to the full after going through such a dark episode in his life good to hear Simon Sai you've signed off with thank you so yeah. much um, it's yeah. a lovely message to get yeah well, in fact I've just read well, I haven't messaged him back we'll um, sort him out comps to Birmingham the live oh, show oh yeah Yes, yeah. because we messaged him back, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, and then he said, oh, when are you next coming? And I think we were sorting it out, so I'll message him. Well, hopefully we'll, we'll see, see you there, Simon. In Birmingham, lovely. Uh, maybe, what else have we got maybe, in the post box? Maybe we could get him a drink afterwards and it'd be a pickled onion. No. Uh, <laughs> fucking hell. <laughs> She's trying to be nice. <laughs> this is from Nicole. I'm not going to give the surname. She might not want me to. Hi, Kirin Rachel. Love the pod. Strong start. I live about 45 minutes from Fall River and I went to the Lizzie Borden house on Halloween 2022. Great. In a lot of ways, it was a great little museum, except they don't have Andrew Borden's picture hung over the couch. Uh, they, listen, they have you sit around the table and just pass the crime scene photos around. What? <laughs> That's worse than what I thought it was. The couch is still very creepy. There were some people on what was ostensibly a regular history tour trying to manufacture their own ghost tour. We were up in the attic and they held up their ghost gizmo and started yelling, oh my God, there's an electromagnetic field here. They were just standing directly under an outlet. The tour guide just went, well, the veil is thin, I guess. 
<laughs> in the basement, they insist you can see a ghost face if you take a picture of this cement wall. Everyone around me insisted they could see a ghost face. I just see a cement wall. Merry Christmas. Thanks for all you do. Nicole in Boston. Nicole, I really like the sound of you and the cut of your jib. Yeah, but, I like But I will say you sound like my partner who will gleefully get involved with things like that and go along to, you know, ghost hunts or history walks or something like that and then spend 45 minutes to two hours debunking it all in the hotel or in the house afterwards. Oh, see, Tim's like that. That's what he did on the ghost tour but in Lincoln. But they still come on them all. Yeah, and they still want to be centre of attention. <laughs> and then Not that you do, like Nicole. Oh, look, I'm looking for the face in the wall here. That is that meant to be the face? Like a, just some bad plaster in that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see anything myself. Um, but yeah. thank you for that. Do you want to switch around in case we can see? I don't think we'll be able to push in. Oh, we'll just show it. Thanks, Owen. Thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's the you. letters bag from this week. So thank you so much for getting in contact. <laughs> if you would like to speak to us, actually, you can. What is the best way? Is the email right? Yeah, email us or killinofillerpod at gmail dot com. Yes. Why not? Yeah, sure. Why um, not? Do check that Owen and pop up what the actual one is at the bottom. <laughs> do we, do email us um, with, you know, stuff like that. There's other stuff you send in. Lovely bit of fun, fun and Some nonsense. other stuff. Often for men. <laughs> it's just not. We've had one before us, guys, like, yeah, I, I see what you girls are trying to do, but what you really need is someone with some, like, insight. And I have been uh, researching this in my own time for seven years, so I'm happy to come on the podcast. I'm like, well, we are happy to block you on every available format that there is. We once got an email. I don't know if I ever showed you, but uh, when I'd been on... I only see them when they're a complaint that you want me to deal with. When, I, when I'd been on House of Games, uh, somebody wrote in to slag off someone else who was on it with what? me who's actually a mate of ours and I went you do know that we are all friends and I think it's absolutely obnoxious for you to message us slagging off another performer they never got back um, who was who was the person I slagged off oh lovely guy I beat that out what you're in, thank you really great person good comedian great comedian lovely guy I mean it'll be really easy because you'll probably be the only two comics on it, right? Yes. <laughs> beep that out. Uh, but beep, beep out comedians, so it just sounds like we're saying <laughs> Yeah. So just stuff like that, you know. It, it's funny because I always think this about comedians. We're very bitchy and we do we do have our fucking, you know, Facebook Yeah, but thick as thieves, innit? Oh, we, we are, I will, there's people I'll defend that I don't even like if someone tries to say Agreed. Them I've got friends who like, I definitely have loads of co in common with comedically, but they're not comics, and I've heard them slag off a comic I think is shit. But yeah. I'm like, no, 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 yeah, no. Yeah, you don't get to do that. Like, yeah, because you haven't got on stage. Yeah, they put the work in, they do the graft, they've been, they're going round and about. I think doing fucking hack as well. <laughs> I don't need to hit, obviously, be that, but I don't need to hear it from you. Yeah, um, I, I hate that kind of stuff. Shall we carry on with the Unibomber? We're on to the bomb section. The bomb section. Um, so he's living in his little hut. Yes, he goes He's, down to the little town. It's ti it's tiny in Lincoln, and there's a really, really minuscule library. And in this library, he uses he uses it as a reference to find different addresses and papers and research by people because the victims. One of the reasons why it's so hard to find is the victims are tenuously linked, so they're kind of to do with science mm -hmm. and technology and yeah. air and air, not not air as in like airplanes and things like that. And so that people are like, I don't know how he's picking these people. And it was he was going to this tiny library and checking out these innocuous books and finding their details. If there. anything, it shows how useful libraries are and how important they can Absolutely. be. Absolutely. Pre, pre the, basically, the, I mean, there's part of me that has to sort of recognise if you're anti-technology and you're trying to track people down to, sa to send them like malicious post, he's doing it all pre-Google. Like he's really, he's really putting the work in, yep. isn't he? Absolutely is. The first bomb occurs on May the 25th, 1978. So a passerby is walking around in um, Chicago uh, Circle campus in at the University of Illinois and they see a package addressed and stamped. So it's been sent and the package had been... was No, it hasn't. Okay, so what they've, they thought that at the so time... So this is the bit that's confusing me. So what it is is the investigation realised, they're like, hold on, you've got this, this bomb in a package, it's got the postage on it ready, but it's just sat by the post box... And they realised it didn't go in. 
So he's made it all and then got there and gone, oh, shit, won't well, go in the box. And he can't go and like get it signed for or anything like that or go into the post office. Ah, okay. So that is why you have this perfectly packaged, labelled bomb outside of the post box. But then, because it's got the address on it, it's taken. Yes. To the, the person that it's meant for. And you know what? God loves the Royal Mail for doing that. Absolutely. Or the post office. Uh, the po- US you know, post awful. office. My, I have a very good relationship with my postman and um, he is... Since they've been bought out, it's absolutely awful the way they treat them. And they've they've said, "Oh, you can get five hundred pound bonus this year." And they were like, "If you hit all your, if you hit your target in your region, you'll get two hundred fifty quid. If the cold country clears everything before Christmas, you'll get another two hundred fifty quid." Anyway, people started they started hitting it, and they never thought they did. They were all working their asses off, so they um, banned overtime so they couldn't hit it, and then got rid of the bonus. They're you awful. bastards. Bastards. Well, yeah, there's bastards. That big scandal. The documentary's coming oh out. Oh my about god, it. about the guy from Stand Did Know. Um there's horrific so many people. It was was it the system that they were using? It was so bad. That, it was this poor guy. It, yeah. Basically the computerized system and it kept it wouldn't it was really faulty. And then he would phone them and go, it can't, you know, the it's not the money is not it's, it's hundreds not recognizing of people that this is yeah. the postmasters uh, yeah the postmaster go the money isn't going through it's not showing up and they were like, oh, it's fine you've just you've got to close the system otherwise you can't open tomorrow you've got to clear the system so they kept clearing it they knew it was going wrong and then what they did is they turned around to these postmasters and they charged them for hundreds of thousands of pounds thousands of pounds worth of fraud and they ru- this one guy I did in particular they just ruined his life I'm really glad there's a documentary about, what about it about four of people taking their own lives from that fucking awful it's abs- an absolute because scandal everyone in their local community thought they were thieves and they were stealing from everyone when it was absolute bullshit and they knew that it was the, it was the computers and they just they just threw money at it and wasted their time in the courts until it all came out see computers Ted Kaczynski technology not actually be wrong about but it, everything. but also it's it's humans who are making the decision to do the evil thing right yeah wow I'm being profound the package <laughs> was taken to the person it was meant for who was Professor Buckley Christ Jr he was like I don't know what this parcel is and he called security <laughs> I like his style what a suspicious guy what? that's pre 9-11 hold on well. a present nobody likes me <laughs> Something's wrong here. <laughs> I've not been on Amazon in days. <laughs> so they, they call the security officer Terry Marker, who opens it and it exploded. And it, he was injured, Terry Marker. So, Well, it, it partially detonates, but it's incredibly, it's described as being a clumsy bomb. So it's, for a start, I mean, this is a hallmark of his stuff. It's encased in wood, cheap wood as well. They always mention it's very cheap wood. So it's got wooden ends to it. It's the one that's full of match heads. So, I mean, even if you collect a lot of match heads, it's still not a big explosion. Mm. Um, but it's it's just a crude implement. And this is, I mean, we're just going to talk about the bombs in this episode. And I would say that, <laughs> that this, this episode will be a testament to if at first you don't succeed because give him his dues, he's a trier. Yep. May 9th, 1979, Northwestern University, Illinois, John Harris, who was a graduate researcher, suffered shock and burns when a cigar box exploded. The box had been made to look like a present Mm -hmm. and it was left in a room used by grad students. A dirty trick. (laughs) It is a dirty trick, though. What, to leave something that looks like a present in a common room? Yeah. Just, well, also, who's the kind of person that goes, I'll open that? Yeah, that, I, I bet there's some social experiment about that, that there's a present left in a room that, you know, several people use and it's not addressed to anybody who who would be the person. Yeah. The person that opened it. Find the cunt, I think the experiment <laughs> would be called. And then they... they who would I would the, never open it. I wouldn't even think about it. I think if it was like a few of us sat around, I'd be like, should we just open that? Like I could I could do it as a team, but I'd never do it on my own. The problem is now that I've we've done this, I wouldn't. Really? No, I'd go outside while someone else opened it. <laughs> Just in case there's a ghost. I'd be like, I'm just going to, yeah. Well, no, I'd just be like, I'm going to get on a bus <laughs> a mile away. I'll ring you when I'm there and then you open it. So, yeah, no address on it. It's it's only, it's like cigar box size. It's basically a, a rudimentary pipe bomb inside. Again, it's described as being very amateur. They're using the powder from fireworks in it. Um, now, he, uh, Ted, writes about all of these bombs. Like, we know they're, they're all down to him because he writes in code in a diary he's using just numbers and then within the it just looks like a row of numbers almost like a completed sudoku 
And all of those words, all those numbers correspond to words and letters. And the code is hidden within the, so the key for it is hidden within the thing. So he keeps a meticulous record, um, but it's anyone who looked at it would be like, this is just a list of random numbers. Mm -hmm. Um, Now he, in this diary, he says that he wants to blind maim or at least blow someone's hands off. He says, oh, well, you live and learn. So like from the beginning, his thing is to... He wants to harm people. Yeah, and not cause it. Because think about all the bombs he sends to all those different people. And it takes that length of time to send the manifesto. Whereas what you would do is go send a manifesto and go, I'm going to start doing bombs until yes. you start doing this. So actually all he wants to do is hurt Yeah, he does, that's, that's all and he wants he, to do. And then I think he's reverse engineering a justification. Yeah, he's a horrible cunt. Yeah. So the FBI don't get involved in any of this until the third bomb. Which I'm not is... getting involved. <laughs> Do you know what? It's nothing <laughs> to do with me. <laughs> do you know what I fucking hate? When there's something like, you, you, that happens in families where people are like, oh, I'm not getting involved. And it's like, by not getting involved, you are getting involved. Listen, I'm not getting involved. The only thing I'm going to say yeah, is... Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> look, it's nothing to do with me. But Or they'll that's... stir the pot <laughs> and then go, well, I thought you were going to pay them back for that. And you're like, no, because they slow me for, oh, well, I'm not getting involved. Like, well, you just caused a fucking oh, fight like, now. Well, I'm not getting involved. I mean, that's what she said to me. <laughs> I, listen, I overheard what was said. And I wouldn't repeat it, but love that kind of shit. I, look, it's nothing to do with me. I can't, I, you know, look, it's not nothing my... Nothing to do with me. Look, I think you look great in them. Look, it's not my family, <laughs> you know? So I'm not getting involved. I love that hands up. I... Nothing to do with me. Tell you what, if it's if it's not my family, I'm more interested in getting involved. Oh, really? Oh, no, I never get involved. Although my, like, in-laws are great, like... Oh, I never get involved. Really? Never I've, get involved. No, no. I, um, yeah, I'll happily... There are members of, like... Wait, what are in-laws now? It's like your partner's family. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, you yeah. get involved? Well, no, I don't get involved. There's nothing oh, to get involved in. she gets involved. Do you know what? I, I tell you what, I won't... <laughs> His dad listens to this now, religiously. She gets involved. <laughs> She's getting involved. <laughs> and he said the other day, he, ph- he phoned him and had a chat with him and was like, uh, "Was we'd been talking about some woman who was poisoning. So he's like, are you okay? How's everything? <laughs> I think he thinks I'm going to murder. Listen, David, <laughs> your son is safe with me. I promise. <laughs> yeah, that's what they all say. <laughs> I'm not getting involved. <laughs> uh, that'll be at the beginning of the documentary. <laughs> hey, <laughs> She did a podcast about murder. <laughs> no, Little did they know. I d- it's because there's nothing to get involved with. They're 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 great. Do you know what I mean? Like, I wish yeah. I could get more involved. No, I'm sick but, of my family stuff. But it's, it's, sometimes it's like you know, certain groups of friends are a bit chaotic. I'm like, oh, I'm not getting, I'm not getting involved. But what happened? Really? <laughs> wow, interesting. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like something they do, but nothing to do with me. You are someone I've seen you like physically rub your hands when you get good. Good gossip. Woo-hoo. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Ooh, yes. But my, do you know it's really funny? My sister does that as well. She really? goes, "What's that? Woo-hoo, strap in. Come on, <laughs> love it." Yeah, my family sometimes sends each other just a strap in. We're like, "Come on, what is it? What's happened?" Anyway, November fifteenth, nineteen seventy nine, American Airlines flight four 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 from Chicago to Washington D.C. This is where the FBI get involved because you can't go around bombing planes. The plane, that, that was a federal offence. You can send bombs to these places, but it's a federal offence to bomb an aircraft. Uh, the plane was filled with smoke after a bomb detonated in the luggage compartment by, the package was sent by airmail. It's only a tiny plane as well. It's like an 80-passenger plane, but it, it makes quite a big, it, it could have been devastating if it had, been, you know, caught one of the tanks or something like that. As it is, is there's no deaths it safely lands but there's 12 people who are treated for smoke inhalation which Mm -hmm. actually in a plane of 80 is quite a lot of people yeah that's horrible as well that's yeah but you you know he's done that those people probably might have had problems for the rest of their lives because of that smoke inhalation it it was more sophisticated this bomb because what he'd done is he'd used a barometer as sort of the trigger for the bomb because he knew that when it uh when the plane would rise it would affect the barometer and that would move and then that would hit the contact and so it's like it's again you can tell he's very bright um but he's also just using my he real blue peter vibes mm. of like this week kids we're going to take a barometer uh, and 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 put it on the airplane so he's he's constantly experimenting and doing weird and wonderful things did you ever make anything from blue peter no my parents would not have entertained that no, no, we never did that either. No, Tracy was... Island was the big one. Wasn't that was it? the big one. Yeah, 
was Anthea Turner, wasn't it? Yeah, or the other one that was like, uh, do you remember it was a Christmas, uh, it was coat hangers with tinsel around them and it was like you put candles on the end. So it was like a mobile that hung up. Actual and, candles? Yeah, well, yeah. I, 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 Yeah, which must have gone up in flames, especially because it's like Jesus 80s tinsel. But the, it's really funny. You can see it somewhere on the internet. Um, he wouldn't like that. Um, Ted Kaczynski, not my not my partner's father. Um, it's, it's Oh, my dad. My dad would be fine <laughs> with that, actually. So it's like these, uh, what are they called? An, an advent, what's it called? Like a, not a chandelier. Like an advent cat wreath. Yes. So it's like yeah. these coat hangers that, that go like that and then there's there's right. candles and then there's another layer underneath and how good it looks on Blue Peter. And then when, when people made them at home, it just looked like, yeah, looked like coat hangers with some it was like wonky candles on the end. See, this is the thing. My... Um, Speaking of my dad, he's very overly safety conscious. Oh, really? So we would not have been allowed to, to make that or hang that up if, if it had candles on it. Like, he's obsessed with safety. Were you not allowed to stand in the fire in a dressing gown? That Absolutely not. Like, obsessed. Really? Yeah, and he's still like that a bit now. But he, uh, So, like, you've been framed. He is... He's not impressed. By, so you've been framed, which is, like, candid camera in, yeah. in America. Funny home videos of people falling over. Brilliant stuff. So <laughs> funny. Probably, I think, the funniest programme on television still today. <laughs> so, so funny. Me and my mum love it. We sit there crying, laughing at everything. And my dad's like, oh, my God, Christ alive. Do you know what? Someone could have been killed there. <laughs> He's like, oh, that child could have broken its neck. He's obsessed with it. He just And he doesn't even call it you've been framed. He calls it you have been framed. <laughs> <laughs> like there's a, someone's you, pointing their finger. You have been framed. <laughs> Uh, yeah, he's so, he's obsessed with like he's mad about. He, he just I don't know. My dad had such a cavalier attitude towards <laughs> safety; it was unbelievable. What's that picture of him smoking? Oh, yeah, well, he's no, he's pouring a jerry can of petrol into it, and he's got a cigarette in the other hand. When we were growing up on the farm, he would put us in the JCB. Uh, like the what's it called? The scoop. Yeah, like oh on my a JCB. God, the, the thing. The thing. He'd lift it up so he couldn't see. Um, but he can like see around it. He also couldn't see if we fell out of it, and he, he would drive us around, and we're like, "Yeah!" But and my mum would be like, "You and because like if we fell, we'd just go straight under it, and he would go over us. There was so much bad stuff that he did that's not okay. Yeah, but you're all fine. It's, yeah. Do you know about the? I must have told this. My brother was out on a motorbike. No. Yes, I have told this. I mean, he's dead now, so who's going to press charges? <laughs> Don't worry, this isn't going to get as dark as it sounds, but it's pretty bad. My brother was a schoolboy scrambler, so like, you know, motocross. So he's going around the fields, and my dad was throwing stones at him to make him go faster. <laughs> this is this is my dad's level of parenting. So he's whipping so stones at my brother. One of them whips, and it like, I think it like knocks the, the handlebar, it knocks, it's something happens with the wheel, and my brother comes off and he goes into a barbed wire fence. And that's why my brother Alistair has a scar oh that runs my God. Like, like that over his eye. And so <laughs> and he's like, do you tell your mother that you just came off that bike <laughs> to come in and take this kid back to the house? He's got like a flap hanging over his He nearly lost his eye. Oh my God. And do you have stitches and stuff? Yeah, so he's got a scar there you can see. But again, I stitches... So often, like that, there, my mum would just stitch us up. <laughs> so really? I, I imagine that's why social services didn't get involved more. So they just do. Uh, yeah, because my mum would like, yeah, because she would do like minor surgery on the animals and stuff growing up on the farm. So yeah, mm-hmm. that was that. And that's that. why you've got um, trotters. And that's why I've got trotters. <laughs> yeah, I lost some feet and then mum's like, I can sort this. We'll sort that. that. Can you see that scar there? That My oh, mum yeah. stitched that when I was about seven. Never had stitches. Um... None. Oh, apart from when I had my wisdom teeth out. No one's going to see that, mother. No, that was just irritating. But no, never um, never had stitches on my face or hands, body. Never had anything like that. Interesting. Ever. Yet. Touch wood. Touch wood. Touch wood gently because otherwise it bangs the mic. <laughs> Touch wood very gently <laughs> for sound reasons. June the 10th, number four this is, June 10th, 1980, United Airlines president Percy Woods was injured I thought he'd like him because his surname was Woods. Well, genuinely, they think that is part of it because he always ah. wrapped his yeah he always wrapped his bombs in wood, and they were like, and he sent it to Percy ah. Woods. So it's a, they think it was a deliberate thing. Well, the bomb was encased in a book called Ice Brothers by Sloane Wilson. Not really anything to do with anything that was. I don't know. No, and it it's was about someone's experience of working in the Arctic or something. Right, um, wilderness in the sort of uh, special. Fo- I don't know. So it, it just had nothing to do with it. 
But I guess that's because he probably wanted him to pick up a book and go, what's this? Yeah. Loads of he also puts loads of false clues and stuff. So this one was uh, return address was to someone called Enoch W. Fish, and then this is the other thing: is the police then have to and the FBI have to investigate it. This is when they realise it's all the same person. It's all related, mm -hmm. and and he gets his nickname Unabomber, which stands for University Airplane Bomber, mm. um, all shoved together. He was injured, Percy Wood, mm -hmm. but he survived. He writes about it in his diary. Ted says, uh, I feel plenty angry, but now I feel able to strike back. So he starts to cause actual injuries, and I think he's sort of galvanised by that. He's enjoying it, isn't he? He is. So, that, yeah, they were, they were really struggling to decipher what was a clue and what was a red herring, because there was both in it. So he always used Eugene O'Neill stamps on stuff, and that was that was like part of it using wood, sending it to someone called Wood, that was also part of it. Um, and at this time as well, lots of the parcels had been in or around Chicago, so they knew that he was most likely familiar with Chicago and he had actually been born there and he just moved away. So they start to get a picture mm -hmm. of him, but they don't actually have any information on him. Well, that's in June 10th, 1980, Percy Woods, and then October the 8th, 1981... A bomb wrapped in brown paper and tied up with string, these are a few of my favourite things, was found in the hallway of the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. Now, that was just detonated without any injuries to anybody. Mm -hmm. People obviously thought, what's this? Well, it was it was a pipe bomb. It was a can, can of petrol and inside was the pipe bomb. So if it had gone off, it would have caused some damage. So he's refining, he's tweaking, he's changing his materials as well. He's moving away from more wooden mm -hmm. components inside. And he would do things like the end of a wire would be capped with wood. Wood. and and they, they were like he can go and buy something like this for pennies and he's choosing not to he's choosing to use cruder materials um do you know what they did this is what annoyed me so they they, they send this thing in the university of utah they find it and security take it and we're like we think this is a suspicious package so they take it to the women's toilets and blow it up there <laughs> it's like we're finally letting women into higher education and we're like <laughs> fucking trash the bogs though yeah they're not having anything nice. And then, once they've blown up in the women's toilets, then they call the Unabomber Task Force. So it's like they don't, they could have called them and gone, we think we've got a package which, you know, there'll be evidence Oh, they just there. wanted to blow they it up. They were like, go, and, it's the security guards are like, go and blow that up. And, and go in the women's toilets. <laughs> don't tell them you're coming in there. The next one was 1982. Mm -hmm. May the 5th, 1982. This is the sixth one. A bomb is sent to the head of computer science at Vanderbilt University. Now, it's opened by the head of computer science's secretary after she opens it in his office. Because mm -hmm. um, people are like that. <laughs> people it open my post. Oh, no, I can see that. If you get loads of posts. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Just open your own post. <laughs> <laughs> then... So this is a few months later in July. Can I just say on yes, that one? Yes, go ahead. So that one is, a, again, it's a pipe bomb with a sink, like a sink U-bend used in it because he'd, he'd pack it full of explosives and shrapnel. So he's trying to cause... As much injury as he can. As much injury as he can. And they realise that they, as the, you know, because they've got the bits of bombs being left behind and they're finding that he is kind of across forensics before it's a widely... Uh, acknowledged kind of school of thought. So he, there was never any hair in it, which is a real feat because he's a hairy boy. Um, so there was never any hair in the bombs and he would sand down all the surfaces so there was no fingerprints. Ah. Yeah. And um, he starts to leave little markers. Um, so coming up in the one that you're about to talk about in July. Just going to ask when you said shrapnel. Did your dad ever refer to change as shrapnel? Yeah, always, yeah. yeah. Mine does that. She's got shrapnel in the back pocket. Yeah. And um, does it also, like, dads use, love a back pocket, don't they? Yeah. Do you know, I was, my dad, I I always think of, you know, um, those, because he used to be a, well, he's a bus driver, but taxi driver was for a long time. He always used to have a bag with him of, like, change. <laughs> that was, just in case anything got just, a bit tasty. Well, because <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd have to get change, wouldn't you? Yeah. I think so. I always think of that. And, but yeah, oh, bag of shrapnel there. You know, that kind of... It's such a weird thing to say. A memory I have of my dad is whenever it, I'd be like, Dad, have you got, you know, like a quid for the trot or whatever? Take it out. And there would always be dog ends. You know, like, <laughs> that's what I don't know what you call them. That's what we call them in our house, dog ends, yeah? So, like, the bottom bit of a cigarette that he's like, well, I will still well, smoke I'll that. I'll that back. Yeah. And I'd see him put it out on his jeans and put it in his pocket. It's so, it's so weird because my, my dad um, doesn't smoke... He doesn't smoke anymore, but he used to smoke a lot. And obviously, as kids, he used to smoke in the car, or you know, he'd come back from work, and it, 
even, you know, being a bus driver, you're allowed to smoke out the window then, so mm. you'd be constantly smoking all day. And I got in a taxi last night to go to where I was staying from the station. And uh, <laughs> I got in a taxi, I was like, I was like my dad in here. <laughs> you know, it was, it was because it was like taxi air fresh and everything. <laughs> and that, that sort of fags. Yeah, yeah. To, and it's like, oh, that's not very nice, is it? He smells a lot better now, may I stress. <laughs> he's a, he, he works for a company where he's got to wear a shirt and tie. Love for that. Driving the coach. So he's a lot cleaner now. Uh, apparently smell is the most powerful trigger of memory. Yes, it is. Absolutely. If I smell dewberry, I'm taken right back. Yeah, it's 1992. To the 90s. Yeah. That was everywhere in Body Shop. Dewberry. Do it for me. Dewberry. But also, do you remember when the Body Shop used to be quite cheap? Because that's where we used to get all our Christmas presents for everyone yeah, at school. Yeah. So you'd get somebody dewberry, white bit of white must. And yeah, those and what, little bath pearls. Shall I let you into a secret? I used to try and eat them eat all those. the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they look delicious. Never learned, did I? <laughs> um, but yeah, what smells, it's, it's really hard for me to explain. There's certain um, men's aftershaves that remind me of people and oh, take yeah. me straight back to... Um, Jean-Paul Gaultier, the man's one. Yeah. Favourite ex-boyfriend. Every single time, straight back there. It's like, really? that, that. But also mixed with leather because he used to wear a leather jacket because he thought it was cool. <laughs> hey, it's just me telling it like it is. Uh, <laughs> you did a microphone hand then, you know? Ah, no, I'm not <laughs> um, I didn't do the accent though. So like that smell. But all, what else reminds me? Like there's certain um, perfumes that remind me... Hairspray always oh, reminds really? me of my gram. Oh, really? Yeah. That, what, an Elnet or something? Elnet. Like certain, the, the ex, what's the expensive one, is it? Elnet is it's the expensive Elnet. one. Yeah. And yeah, because she, she always used to do, spray all her hair up. That's, hairspray reminds me of that. We can't have lavender. That's why I've got, I'm burning a lavender can, oh, yeah. candle right now. Because I can burn it in here. We can't have it in a house because um, my partner's uh, late mother loved lavender. So. Oh. Let me tell you guys, you all know this. It's an absolute nightmare to find a pillow spray. Because <laughs> everything has got lavender in it because it's relaxing. And he, fair play, he doesn't want to sleep. It's yeah, yeah. an incredibly yeah. evocative thing. But it means I can't even plant lavender on the farm that he's, you know, just doesn't like Get it. rid of him. Get rid of him. Get, yeah, rid, get of him. rid of him. Break off the engagement. Yeah. Buy some lavender. Have a nice pillow spray. <laughs> Actually, I've got a ginger one that's lovely at the I'm moment. I think what other smells remind me of things. This is a very specific thing. Do you know um, You know when you get in a taxi and you smell chef's ass? Yeah. It makes me, me. think of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, this is such a weird specific one. My granddad used to eat cheese and tomato butties, which I love, but also he just used to eat tomato butties and sometimes he just used to have a tomato with a bit of salt on it, just as like just eating a tomato. And uh, <laughs> he, always used to, he always used to wear like a jumper but because he'd eat tomato loads, there'd often be little tomato seeds in his jumper. <laughs> so when you went, you hugged him. You, your face was always in tomato seeds. <laughs> so carbolic soap and tomato seeds. Oh, always so reminds nice. me of my granddad. Yeah, which is weird because Tim likes to use carbolic soap. I like carbolic so, soap. Yeah, but I'm just like, oh great, now I've got to think of my dead granddad. Have her, thank you. <laughs> oh, mm, someone I love died. Lovely. I wonder what. Do you know? Have we spoke about people's houses and how they smell? Yeah, and like. I, I love it when you find someone who's got a similar smelling house to you. I find it really comforting. Yeah. Like, I think I, my, I smell of, like, coal and coal tar and, and dog. Like, I think my house has a really it, specific smell. It smells smells. of, like, wood, wooden, yeah. like, burning. What does my house smell of? Oh, God, I shouldn't have asked it. I don't want to ask this. What is your... What's it? <laughs> Jizz when it's dried on a... Yeah, yeah, yeah that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> Come crust. <laughs> <laughs> He's a great actor, though. <laughs> <laughs> now, what do you smell like? What does your? Well, you've always got a candle I or something a candle. on the go. I tell you what, I do. Like, I love a joss stick. Yeah, she does. Which Tim hates. <laughs> He fucking hates it. So I'm always like, like he's like, oh, do you know what it smells like in here? That record shop that I used to go to when I was a teenager. <laughs> it's sort of that. Now sort of, Champa. Yeah, like um like Affleck's Palace in Manchester mm. smells. I love a bit. Oh, of I got it. you some I got you some incense cones there in the house. Lovely. I also have. I've got you some white sage ones so you can cleanse your bad fucking Thank attitude. God, that's just what I need. <laughs> I have also Tim bought me for Christmas, not this year, last year. Oh last not last year, year before. Here we go, twenty twenty four. And uh he bought this. It was by far my favourite present. It's it's a wolf <laughs> incense cone thing. And you put the incense cone, you put the wolf over it. And it looks like the wolf's... 
That's great. I love that. Do you it's know great. what? There's a there's a restaurant on the coast of um of Venice Mall on the way to Manor Bridge called Chateau Rianva. And when you drive past it, the extractor from the kitchen, they've built a massive fake dragon head over it. Oh, so it's nice. really good. So it looks like smoke's coming out of it all the time. That is. It's a beautiful, Perfect. beautiful building that you can see if you go on the rib ride on the straits. It's great. And it's stunning and it's got like these round turrets. I've never eaten there, but apparently the food's good as well. And it was built, this guy built it as a love, like a love proposal to this woman, which is very topical actually, because this is coming out about Valentine's Day, isn't it? It is, yeah, actually. Yeah, I hope you had a lovely time. And I, um, it is a love token to her. Yeah, and she looked at it and she went, not for me. She didn't even stay in it. No, you know Yeah, she was like, oh, not my taste. I I also got a for my sister for Christmas. I got her a plague doctor incense calm thing. Oh, that's great. Because here's the thing: do you know my sister's got a tattoo of a plague doctor? <laughs> no. Well, that's something that's happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, Valentine's Day. We should talk about that, right? What's your vibe? Hate it. Oh. I think it's stupid. It was stupid. Well, it's daft, isn't it? I mean, it's nice if yeah, if you're into that kind of thing. But I, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not bothered. I find it. I get embarrassed about stuff like that. You know, but, ooh, I don't, ooh, it makes me it's feel It's so funny what you're what you're not embarrassed by. I know, but I just feel a bit... The dry bumming. <laughs> you say one thing once, <laughs> eight years ago. <laughs> Crass that. <laughs> and yet, this, it's so funny what you are and aren't embarrassed by. Like, I, your stand-up's very, like, forthright. And some people yeah. be like, oh, God, I, I could never say that. But then you're like, oh, can't watch Panto. That's, well, that's embarrassing. Do you know what never worked in my stand-up? And I, I kept trying to get it. I think it's because it jars with my persona. Is I tried to do this bit about greetings cards and how I found them crass. Yes. I and remember. not very na- And it never works because I, I just think people are like, hang on a minute. Why are you offended by that? When well, you I just think said, oh, you are like a, an old maid in some ways. That you'd be like, oh, I was in this shop. And it's just... But, uh, can it's like oh happy birthday you're cunt yeah horrible. <laughs> there's no need for it like it's so nasty like you know oh happy birthday you, you you're so old you, all your friends smell a wee it's like that's <laughs> offensive ageist and and cruel and just oh you, you've made me think so in my little desk opposite here i whenever i'm in tk max or whatever i always go through the like reduced cards bit and i have like a Base level oh, yeah. of happy birthday ones, baby ones, everything. But also I'll pick up cards throughout the year. And then so in that drawer there, so my normal cards are behind Owen on the left and in the drawer on the right on the top is cards with a post-it note on because I'm like, oh, that'll be great for Kath. And then because I've got ones for people, I've got one for my birthday card for my dad in there and oh. one for my parents' anniversary. I have to be like, which of the old oh. cunts do I know that I can use this for? But I've got like this card of like, because I've been... So normally I'm like, yes, I only paid 90p for that thing. And I'm like, well, that's a fucking waste oh, of money. you should just keep those, though. What for? It's just nice to keep, isn't it, you know? Um, I think you should nah. just keep keep those. You I can think. have them. Well, I don't want them. <laughs> but I think you should just keep them, you know, it's nice. I'll go and put keep. them on, a, wherever I end up pouring his ashes, I'll go and put the card on it put for his birthday. the card birth. on yeah. for his birthday. He'd love that. Would he like that? No. <laughs> No. <laughs> he'd hate that, would he? He'd, he'd, he'd absolutely <laughs> hate that, yeah. He'd fucking hate that. Um, what were we on about? We were talking about smell. Oh, yeah. Um, so we're down to... He, he At this point, he's done this this pipe bomb. The assistant opens the package. That's what yep. we're up to. Now, at this point, the investigation is broad and they've got a kind of profile about what they think this guy is. There's 200 suspects that they're actively monitoring. He is not in those 200 suspects. He writes in his coded diary at the time... I'm finding it frustrating that I cannot make a lethal bomb. So he's just being really open about... He just wants to kill someone. He does. And this is just his pretend... He's any old fucking arrogant male serial killer. He's just dressing up with yep. a manifesto. So this was a July 2nd, 1982. Package bomb left in the break room of Corrie Hall University of California, Berkeley. That explodes and injures uh, an engineering professor. There's some weird things going on here. So one, they find a little piece of shrapnel and on it is uh, with sort of like a, a pointed thing. He's, he's he's put like dots almost and it spells out the letters F and C. Mm-hmm. Now these bits of... Fucking cunt, yeah. 
<laughs> well, do you know what? There's a really funny bit in one of the documentaries where they are the they start appearing these FCs, 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 and things. And so there's a whiteboard where they show the FBI's kind of workings of it, and they've got all the things and things are on there. Felix the cat, uh, false Christ, fries chicken. <laughs> like, what is it? What is it? It's the colonel. Um, <laughs> So it, the FC moniker appears for the first time, that, so they're able to actually see it. And also on the package, I think it's on a letter in it, it says Wu, as in W-U, the, the Chinese surname, mm-hmm. Wu, it works. I told you it would. And then R-V. And this is an example of a completely false clue, a red okay. herring. Because then what happens is the FBI investigate everybody with called Wu, you know, with the surname Wu. They look for anyone with the initials R V, they look of where it crosses over and it's just a time wasting exercise. What did FC mean? FC ended up standing it for Freedom Club. Of course it did. Pretty cool guys. Which which I think just sounds like a supermarket um sort of own clothes brand for boys. Yes. Yeah. Freedom Club, where yeah. there's like a picture of a you know, dinosaur on the front. Yeah, of yeah, it. Freedom Club. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Little Miss Homemaker for the girls. Yeah, absolutely. They're mad. It's mad that we still have like really gendered stuff in. Well, it's, you know, because when I was growing up, I never used to wear sort of girly stuff. I used to prefer boys stuff mm. or just like neutral stuff. Like, I had, um, in fact, you've, have you ever seen a picture of me who got really short hair as a kid? Mm. Just like a fucking... I used to, people used to think I was a boy all the time. I've got a picture I'll show you in a bit where I look just like a boy. I've got like a Beatles shag haircut and I'm in a I'm in a little boy's T-shirt, little boy's yep. shorts, and the girl next to me is in like a very sort of like, <laughs> like flouncy dress. Do you think it's... You just don't want to conform? I think it's... I specifically remember having a pair of Seeker trainers, which would be like some Snyder yeah. make onto the market, and I loved them and I wore them out. And I remember thinking, and they were boys' trainers, and I remember thinking, these are great because I can go really fast in these. Do you know, I was talking about this, your trainers that you have at school, this, I think this is why I like trainers. I never had snide trainers, but I would be bought a pair of trainers, but that, and that was expected to last me for like five years, right? So there used to be a lad I went to school with uh, in junior school and he was the first person I knew with a satellite dish and his house used to back onto the school playground. We used to go, oh God, he's got a satellite dish. He's seen the Simpsons, you know. <laughs> and then he had Simpsons trainers and I remember thinking, oh my God, he must be a millionaire. How has he got a satellite dish and Simpsons <laughs> trainers? But there were just no-make trainers, really. Yeah, yeah. But because I'd never seen them before, I was like, yeah. God, his mum and dad must be millionaires. I remember all my trainers would come from Slangovny Market and they'd be like, those Nicks with the upside-down ticks and yeah, all that yeah. kind of stuff in them. That, yeah. These are Nike. Are they? Yeah. Great. No fucking grip on them. But Listen, I'm not if gonna Nike want to sponsor these, this... These are Air Jordan boots, uh, but I'm not going to take it up with Michael Jordan because I don't think he gives a fuck anymore. <laughs> but they... Uh, they cost more than they should and they're very slippy. So I won't be slam dunking in these. Thank you very much. <laughs> or at all. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> um, apparently women can't slam dunk. Did you know that? Really? Is it the boobs? Physicality. Bullshit. Apparently it's true. Bullshit. Apparently it's true. So, um, this at this point, the investigation splits. Also, oh, don't write in about that because I don't care. <laughs> the investigation splits. The FBI say, right, we'll deal with the bombs. And the Postal Inspection Service say, we'll deal with the actual devices that have come through the post. Um, I actually think the FBI should deal with all of it, if you ask me. <laughs> Why yeah, the Postal Service deal? I agree. We'll, we'll make sure. How are you going to... How well, I, you know? I honestly think that they just didn't have the workforce for it and they weren't moving forward and they wanted someone else to blame. Sounds about right. That's me. May the 15th, 1985, another one at the same place, mm-hmm. Corey Hall, injures an engineering student. Yes. June the 13th, 1985, mm-hmm. a suspicious package is sent to Boeing Fabrication Division in Washington. It's safely detonated, um, but most of the forensic evidence is lost. Mm-hmm. Tenth one. May the November the fifteenth. He's 1985. banging them out. Fast he really now. is. Yeah. There's a short hiatus for a couple of years, but then he starts going again, and he he's is really going refined for it. his technique. This is at the time when the neighbours are hearing him testing bombs, but not knowing that's like, oh, what it was. Ted up to? Yeah. <laughs> well, as long as he's quiet. God, he's really going on that pinata, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> November the fifteenth, nineteen eighty-five, University of Michigan. A psychology professor and his assistant are injured when they open a package that contained a three-ring binder that had a bomb in it. The bomber, the person who sent it, <laughs> I don't know why it's so funny. 
<laughs> it's not funny. The bomber included a letter. It reminds me of that, that's why. The bomber included <laughs> a letter asking the professor to review a student's student's master thesis. Mm-hmm. So obviously they opened that and like. Now, December the eleventh, nineteen eighty five, just a month after this, this is the first fatality that Ted it's important to say that he has caused like massive amounts of damage. Yeah, like, he's injured people. He's the bomb on the fifteenth of May in eighty five is um is it John Hauser who's opening it? He loses his fingertips and there's I mean he's there's an interview with him where so he's on his uh, right hand he's not got the ends of his fingertips and he's got like a hole it's healed now but a hole in his arm where it sort of blasted Awful. through and he was a uh, he's something to do he was uh, he was a pilot and he had an air force ring on and it blew off and there's a nuts picture of it imprinted on the wall oh my god the air because it had been blown off at such speed the finger of the ring had come off and it it was like it had been punched well more like more fiercely than a, than a human could have done it it's so he is creating powerful bombs that can really yeah hurt and people. he's injuring people he's frightening people yeah um, and FC is stamped into all of these. They find it on a bit of metal in all of these bombs now moving forward. So December the 11th, 1985, this is the first fatality. It's mm. a bomb that is left in the car park of Rentec, which is a computer rental computer shop in Sacramento. Now, the owner, Hugh Campbell Scrutton, who was 38 years old, he leaves work to go into the car park, and moments after he leaves the store, the device uh explodes now a person arrived at the scene and they heard hugh say oh my god help me which is horrible he was only alive for a few seconds he bent down to pick it up and it exploded and the shrapnel basically tore through his Ugh. heart and and took his hand off as well so they think that he was dead very quickly well he was pronounced dead at twelve thirty four p.m at the university medical center his chest as you say took the full force of the blast there were no known witnesses and the blast shook the entire shopping centre that the store was located in and shrapnel was scattered for 150 yards, but there were no other injuries because nobody was around. It's a horror. Yeah. And that's just like some guy who runs a computer shop. This is the thing is like you're not bringing down, mm. not that it's ever, I'm not inciting violence here, but like... Makes a you're, change. <laughs> you're not attacking politicians. You're not attacking no. policymakers. You're not attacking... But like a, just a guy who has a computer shop, that is not, like he's not, Everything that's wrong with the world no. really no. pierces me off. Um, now, on February, the he obviously thinks, oh, well, this is the way to do it. So February the 20th, 1987, in Salt Lake City, there was another bomb in a mm. car park of a computer shop. And this injured the store manager, 26-year-old Gary Wright. He um, picks up a mailed package in the store car park, which was left by an unknown man an hour before at 9.40. Now, this annoys me. Two witnesses saw a man leave the package and then hurry away, and they didn't contact the police. They said that they were trying to contact their boss about it. Well, from the police. Yeah, this is a very weird one. It's weird. He gets seen. Obviously, he looks completely different. We talked about that in the last episode where he would, like, shave himself. It's quite a famous description that's given of him, an image that's put into newspapers that people start to get on T-shirts when the manifesto is released because he becomes this anti-hero. Yeah, I knew you'd hate that. You know, the poor guy, he pulls up and there's a parcel in his parking space. So he gets out and he boots it out of the way. And as he does, he ex- it explodes and he, he severs a nerve in his arm. So he has permanent damage from that. But because this sketch is being circulated, this is the first bit of real evidence. So he's wearing sunglasses and a hoodie. Yeah. Um, and this the fact that this description is being circulated absolutely everywhere it's shown on the news it's in all the papers it leads to a 6 year hiatus yep. so in this 6 year hiatus he's out there bearing in mind his bombs have been getting steadily more sophisticated and more deadly this is where he's like right i'm going to change the actual material i'm using so i'm not going to use match heads and bits of firework he's going to learn how to cook bombs properly in a way as in you know, more explosive stuff. Sounds to me like you know. Like, well, do you know no. what? The only reason, no, the only reason I know <laughs> is because I'm trying to buy fucking ethical cleaning products and they're like, you need citric acid. And then everyone's like, it's really hard to buy citric acid after the 7 7 attacks oh, in London okay. and things like that. So, um, why are you pointing at me? I didn't do it. Well, someone, after someone the, uh, attacked Gary Barlow. <laughs> um, he was in the 7 7 bombings. Do you know was that? Was it Gary Barlow? Gary Barlow was in the 7 7 bombings. What, in what capacity? He was on a, ch- a bus or a tube. Gary Barlow. Yeah, but think of the year it was. He's absolutely... Oh, okay. He's on a freedom pass. That's weird. <laughs> yeah, it's it's in his autobiography. Have I read it? You bet, yeah. 
Wow. Is there a chapter called Mini Elton? Yep. Where he talks about how he just wants to be like Elton John and tries to decorate his house like him and stuff. Do you know what I think we were laughing at the other day? So we, uh, we watched... You're either, you either like that kind of stuff or you don't, Gary. Yeah, I, you can't force like no. to love Gold Barack. No, you can't. Can you? No. Um, speaking of Gold Barack, have you watched the Tyson Fury Netflix series? No. It's great. I can't be asked. Um, he's the worst person ever. She's amazing. Paris. Yeah. And I would say, watch it because you'll be like my partner and I, 50% of you are like, well, that is gorgeous. And 50% of you are like, that's Absolutely the worst thing not. ever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's like, it's a fine line, it's isn't it? It's such a fine line. Because they've got like these amazing Versace dressing gowns. You're like, oh, that's really cool. And you're like, yeah, but their bed's a giant throne. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like, it's really, like, it really teases on the edge of me, but it's a, gr- it's a great watch. Okay. I was watching it during the great greatest and largest arts festival in the world, the Edinburgh Fringe. Oh. And genuinely, I'd be on stage and I'd, or I'd be like watching in tarot and I'd be like I can't wait to go and just watch the Furies <laughs> like I, honestly like everything that I was doing I was like oh, I guess I'll be back in with the Furies in about 40 minutes doing the, the last bit of this yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good night <laughs> <laughs> just running through the streets of Edinburgh to get back to it was exactly what I needed got a really interesting accent as well I, I don't know if it's it's almost like a bit stoked they're really I don't know if it's because they're his wife is a traveller as well mm. I don't know if it's an accent that's specific to that group um, like like the travellers in that area sound like that, but it's a really unusual, really cool yeah, yeah. accent. Anyway, why was I talking about this? We started with citric acid. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank God Owen's here. <laughs> citric acid. I can't remember now, but it was... Because you can't buy it because it's used for explosives. Yeah, yeah, I've said that. I've said my piece. Right, well... He was cooking bombs. He was cooking, cooking bombs. bombs. That sounds like a compliment. Yeah. You are cooking bombs. Absolutely, cooking on bombs. <laughs> Does sound like you've had a good gig. It should he was cooking bombs last night. Yeah, yeah, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> Did I tell you that? Should we start saying it and see if it catches? Oh up? yeah, definitely. We'll try and make that now. Oh, it's absolutely cooking. Oh bombs. my god, Scott Bennett the other night was absolutely cooking bombs. Oh, lovely Scott Bennett. I saw him at Christmas. What a good egg. Um, um he. What was I going to say? Something about looks cooking. very Scandinavian, Scott. Don't you he think? He does. Yeah, he does look Scandinavian. Yeah. Very sharp. Yeah, face very blonde hair. Oh, this is what I was going to say. Okay. Is so? Do you know that Gary? Do you know that Gary Barlow is married to one of the former dancers? He's been married long right, time yeah, yeah. till dawn, and it's like so. I knew that obviously from reading the book and being obsessed with Gary Barlow. Um, but isn't it really funny if you step back and it's like it's just Gary and Dawn from Frodsham? Yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, wow, Gary and Dawn. Oh, yeah, from Frodsham. I think that's so funny. I don't know why. Dawn I find and it. Gaz. Yeah, Dawn and Gaz. <laughs> dawn and Gaz are going to do the dogs while we're away. <laughs> Oh, they're good. They're good people. Do you know? Not. Do you know? What I think needs to I stop. They need to stop trying to make a thing. Um, those two from Spandau Ballet, the Kemp's. Yeah, stop trying to make it. They try to make some comedy show. Oh yeah, it's like and this, you, the one of the sons is on everything. Yeah, stop. He? We we don't. We're not bothered about you. Well, I think there's probably people who are. I would put that to the nation as a <laughs> as a referendum. <laughs> A respect, yes or no. Respect the will of the people. A yes or no. Are you bothered about the Kemp's in any capacity? Yes or no. And we will come back with a resounding 97% no. Okay. Let's see how bothered you are now. The Kemp's and the Whams. What are they? No, not oh. Whams. What are the other ones? The, the twins. Bross. Oh, Bross. The Kemp's and the Brosses, Fights of the Death. Would you watch it? Yeah. If they all... No, I can't say that. What if they all died? If they all died. Yeah, I just, I just think. I mean, that the thing is that Bross documentary was good because it it was entertaining at the time, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. And it was good because it was natural and it was funny for the right reasons and the wrong reasons. And it, but now the Kemp's trying to make a parody of that. It's not funny. You're not fucking funny. <laughs> you are not funny. It's really hard to be funny, and they are not funny. Yeah, I think I do think that. Like, I haven't seen it, um, but I do think that there is loads of people who think that being funny is an easy thing. Yeah. We're not, we don't want this Do, either. My partner has a bugbear with people who've hosted SNL and he's like, oh, this person's hosted SNL and it's made them come away thinking they're funny as <sighs> opposed to they're being propped up by incredibly funny people yes. around them. Yes, Um uh, I beep this. In he can't do comedy and it's a comedy Please role. Please stop. Anyway. Yeah. So back to... Bombs. Back to bombs. June 22nd, 93. Yes. So this is a long time after. So the, the 1987, 
was the one, the previous one. So we're going to, yeah, 22nd of June, 1993. A gene- geneticist at the University of California was injured after opening a package in his kitchen. Imagine that. That would have come from nowhere as well. Like, we, Everything's also, calmed down. They all thought no. he was in jail. They were like, he's been caught, but we just don't know it's him yet. Or he's dead. Or he's dead. And then what happened is the packages, when they come back, he's massively refined it. They're much smaller and they're much more lethal. So this person is just, a geneticist as well it's kind of like mm. nothing to do with some people who owned a computer shop opens it and it yeah devastating on june the 24th 1993 no pissing about here this is just two days later a prominent computer scientist from yale lost several fingers uh to from a mailed bomb david galunta he still has problems to this day with his injuries by the way he opened a package on his desk assuming it was a dissertation and he opened it and smoke started billowing out of it and a flash happened. So he, he's obviously got smoke in his eyes. So he's like, I'm going to go and wash my eyes. But as he was washing his eyes, he realised he was bleeding profusely. And he had no fingers. And he realised, he was like, okay. What well, was he I'm... washing his eyes with? <sighs> Christ knows, I don't know. That bit. <laughs> That's not the important bit, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. He headed, so he obviously thought, well, I'm, this is not good. And he hobbled down several flights of stairs. And this is what he described himself as, in pain and royally annoyed. <laughs> um, well, I'm absolutely furious. Oh, God. <laughs> um, so had he waited, he would likely have bled to death. Wow. So he was injured in the chest, face and hand. He still can't use his right hand to this day. When they came to investigate the uh, room where the, the bomb had uh, exploded, his, his shoe was in there. And his shirt had been what? blown off in the blast as well, yeah. I, that's the kind of excuse I give for a messy bedroom. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, I, I do that all the time. I'm like, oh, sorry, we're, we're moving out of this room or we've, we've just been painting. <laughs> we're just having some work yeah. done. <laughs> sorry, I had a bomb in here and that's why my <laughs> shit's everywhere and my dirty knickers are on the floor. Oh, I don't mean shit, it's in shits no, everywhere. But, like, but it's not that isn't bad. dirty knickers such a horrible thing to dirty, say? I'm, I mean, I'm actually pretty good at putting my dirty knickers in the wash, but... Oh, I'm very funny about my underwear. I think I've said this before. Yeah, you are. No one else. I think it was up to you. You'd bury it in the woods at night. I just think, you know, have some dignity. What? Not have pants? No, have your pants, but wash them yourself. You won't let Tim wash your pants? No, I won't. I mean, I do the majority of the washing. I don't like men touching my clothes anyway. I wash my own clothes. I'm weird about it. I don't like it. I don't like people touching my clothes. Fine. Don't like it. I just there's something gives me the creeps. I've said this before. I don't know what it is. Yeah, it isn't it creeps. creepy when someone you've chosen to share your life with <laughs> briefly touches some fabric that touches don't, your I body? I just don't like it. it. Gives me the creeps. Um, now, fine with a cock up the ass, but don't touch my yeah, pants. Absolutely fine. <laughs> just, oh God, it's, a, it's twenty. It's a new year, and still, <laughs> De- fifteen December the nineteenth, nineteen ninety four. Christmas, you late this one. Yeah. News ju- now, this isn't funny, actually. None of this is funny, may I stress, but this bit is particularly not funny. Um, so, curb your attitude. <laughs> I'm being as good as gold here. Right, December the 19th. This is the 15th one, the penultimate penultimate bombing. 1994, a New Jersey ad executive called Thomas J. Moser. He was 50 years old. He was at the time at the top of his career. He was the vice president at Young and Rubicam Ad Agency in New York. He had a wife, uh, he had two daughters at home, aged 13 and 15 months, bit of a gap, no judgment. And he had two older children from a previous marriage who were grown up and living in different cities. Feels like judgment, doesn't it? No, nothing to do with me. <laughs> nothing to do with me. The package that the bomb was sent in had been signed for the previous fri- the, the Friday before the, the day it was opened. The night that the package was signed for, the Moses were having a party for the neighbourhood, including several children that were there. So if that package had been opened, mm. God knows what would happen. The explosion occurred, though, when his daughters and a 13-year-old friend were in the house as well. So it could have been It was horrendous. sent from San Francisco as well. So, like, he's all over the shop. Like, he must travel for days because mm. he's only got a bicycle. And I assume he's on public transport. It's always fine to use fucking technology then, isn't it? But... Could, Unless there was someone else involved and he sent it to them in San Francisco and they sent it on from there. Yeah, maybe. But there's a big risk in Hello, it going off. Hello, is that off. the FBI? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's got another risk. one of my theories. <laughs> Hello, how are you guys? <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> so, yeah, that was um, awful, that. Yeah. Horrible. All of it's horrible. And then the last one, April, the 16th bomb, April... 24th, 1995, 
Again, another fatality. Final victim, Gilbert Murray. He was killed as he opened a small, heavy package which was wrapped in brown paper. The package had been addressed to William N. Dennison, who was the, who'd served as president and chief executive of California Forestry Association. He was a highly visible figure in very contentious environmental issues. But he was also like basically the guy who did the job before him. Yes. So I think that's an example of where he's gone to the library, he's got the address and the name. And since that time... In the old handbook. Yeah, in the old handbook. And then he's he sent it on and someone... Yeah. Well, Paul Gilbert Murray. And do you know what they kept... Because obviously it was... Gilbert Murray opened a package not meant for him. And I'm not saying he deserved it, of course. But like the papers basically did. They went after yeah. the guy it was addressed to. And yes. go, you must feel bad. Yeah, I mean, and, and this guy who, who his predecessor, William Dennison, he cut, had his phone cut off because they were kept haranguing him to talk about his opinion Awful. on it. He's like, listen, I've retired, mate. Leave me alone. Yeah. So, yeah, very odd. So you would feel bad about that. I mean... Of course. You'd feel absolutely elated, but also like shit at the same yeah. time. So this is in late April of 1995. On June 28th, 95, the New York Times and the Washington Post both get sent a 35,000-word manifesto. Oh, my God. In instant reaction there. <laughs> <sighs> In it, he says, if you publish this unredacted in full, then I will stop killing. We are the Freedom Club. And he signs off FC and we have they take responsibility for the bombs. It was called, what was his manifesto called? Oh, I haven't got it yet, I've but we're going to do a whole here. ep on the manifesto. Oh, and God, his... I'm going to hate that. <laughs> I'm actually just going to read it aloud for the whole time. <laughs> um, so, yes, this is where he basically comes undone um so we'll draw a line there and then we'll talk about the manifesto and him being caught and present day in part three remind me in the next episode to tell you about the new year's challenge i'm doing a new year's challenge i only thought i mentioned it because i've got to mention it out loud so then i've got to do it so basically you know i did my half marathons last year i'm not doing that again uh not a fucking chance of me running again <laughs> not with these hips i i'm doing a race to the stones which is a two-day thing where you walk an ancient path and you end up at the Avebury Stone Circle. You're on a pilgrimage? No. Y yes. No, it's not Goddy, but loads of people... Do. Some people do it as an ultramarathon in one day, but I'm going to walk it. It's going to take me two days. So you're walking to some ancient Fucking two stones. Right and I'll tell you what, right? I'm gonna... Rachel, it's a pilgrimage. It's not a pilgrimage, and I, I can't wait. And I asked my mate James if he wanted to do it, and he ignored me. <laughs> so I, I'm going to do it on my own. But what you do is you do like one day's walk, and then you, you have a little tent, they give you a tent, and you sleep there, and then you set off again. How many so, miles do you walk a day? Oh, I don't know. I've got to work that out. I think it's like 47 miles altogether. Okay, yeah. It's doable. That's a lot. But I think it's going to be really good. And I'm saying it out loud. Um, so I've got to do it. But then I thought, because it's in July, I'll learn my show. Yeah, it's a really good idea. Two days. Whoosh, just your thoughts. Awful. Learn it. You'll hurl yourself off the stones when you Might get there. Might do, yeah. <laughs> Love Avebury Stone Circle. I don't well. know what it is. Oh, it's nice. There's a lot of stone circles here, you know. Let's go and have a dance. Because everywhere they have a nice stone circle, of, they build a sort of stone circle if there wasn't one already. I want an old one, not a new one. Yeah, there's there's old ones. How old? I don't know. Stop doing that with your hands. That's what you do. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, do you know what? Like it's a shame we can't be here in a couple of weekends' time because Chris Maggie Noggy oh. is here with the Mary Lloyd. Oh, we doing it. You doing it here? The Bumaris. There's one in Bumaris on the 13th of January. It's a shame. You're welcome to come up if you're not working. Okay, I'll have a think I'm going to go and that. have a like drink that. with Mary. And the kids make these little candle things out of um, orange peels and they bring the candles along and say hello to Mary. And, and then stuff. you sacrifice an Englishman. And then we sacrifice an Englishman, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that is, if you're listening, David, that's why I'm with your son. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening. We will see you with the third and final part of the Unabomber, episode 105, uh, in a couple of weeks. And, oh my gosh, Tickets. when this is going out. Well, I, I, who knows what's sold out? Who knows what's sold out now? But I mean, we are in some huge rooms, so I think Manchester and Glasgow will still have some left. But we will be seeing you all in a couple of weeks, and we can't wait. <laughs>